Chapter 17 is called Double Trouble. And let's see where Boody's going to go in this part of the story. Chapter 17, Double Trouble. Roshi isn't at work the next day. The foreman asks me where he is and I tell him that I don't know because I don't. He tells me to tell Roshi that he's fired. I try to argue, but the foreman ignores me. I try again and he strikes me with the rotan. While I'm still wincing against the pain, he turns around and waves to a girl on the other side of the factory. She hurries over and sits in Roshi's seat. She starts sewing. Every few minutes, I glance at the door in the hope that Roshi is just running late. After a caning and a week on the boxing section, he might be allowed to keep his job, but Roshi doesn't turn up. No matter how many times I look at the door, it doesn't open. Eventually, I turn to the new girl and ask her who she supports. If she's going to be sitting next to me from now on, I should probably find out what kind of person she is. Well, what do you mean, she says, staring at her machine. Which team do you support? Real Madrid, Manchester United, Barcelona? Oh, I don't really like football, she says, placing the finished upper on a pile and starting a new one. I can hardly believe it. This is a nightmare. Who doesn't like football? How am I supposed to sit next to someone who doesn't know the first thing about Real Madrid? I am suddenly struck by a terrible thought. Do you know who Kieran Wakefield is? She turns her head to look at me. No. Should I? My mouth falls open. Does she live on another planet? Uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter, I mumble. I look at the door and cross my fingers. Come on, Roshi, come on. But still he doesn't come. After possibly the most boring day that anyone has ever worked, I walk home with my hands in my pockets. If my day had been a football match, it would have been a goalless draw. Not even a shot on target. Nil, nil. The rain has stopped, but the sky is low with dark thunderclouds. I drag my feet, not wanting to get home too soon. Dad will still be gone. Mum will still be upset. Grandma will still be quiet. And this is the last time I'll walk home to my signed poster of Kieran Wakefield. Cars and scooters crawl along beside me, pouring their fumes out into the air. They jostle for the tiniest spaces. They beep at nothing. I pick my way through the gaps, turning off the main road and into the maze of side streets. The washing lines that hang between the buildings are empty, like Real Madrid have lost the title. I wonder what will happen in the match tonight, but it doesn't really seem that important anymore. Maybe Roshi was right. Maybe it is time for me to wake up. When I get home, mum is getting ready to visit the police station. I don't know if they'll let me speak to Elvis, she says, wrapping a scarf around her head, but I've got to try. There's a tray of rice on the table for your dinner. Sorry there isn't anything else, but until your father is released, that's all we can really afford. Mum leans over and kisses me on the head. Are you watching the football at Roshi's tonight? I nod, even though obviously I'm not. Good, it might help take your mind off things. Mum steps across to the doorway, then changes her mind and comes back. She crouches down in front of me so that her eyes are lower than mine. Everything will be okay, understand? This is just a bit of rough patch. But we'll get through it. We always do. Don't we, Grandma? Grandma nods from her armchair. She smiles, but she looks tired. That's right, she says. Everything always works out in the end. Mum stands up and leaves without another word. On the table, there are two steel trays with a small mound of rice on each. You can have mine, Grandma says. I'm not that hungry tonight. But you've always got an appetite, Grandma. I know, she says, sighing, but not tonight. What I could really use is a cigarette, but I've only got a few left and I want to make them last. 
I sit down to try and eat slowly, but it's all over in three mouthfuls. Then I slide Grandma's tray towards me. Are you sure, Grandma? I ask. Go on, she says, her eyes closed, her head resting on her chest. You're a growing boy. You need it. We should share it, I say. But all I get in reply is a soft grunt. So I eat Grandma's dinner as well. By the time I've finished, Grandma is snoring quietly, so no one sees me leave with the poster. There is a pawnbroker on the edge of the market who buys all kinds of things and sells them on to other people. He always has wads of cash folded around his fingers, so I know if anyone has the money to buy something rare and expensive, it will be him. The muddy ground between the market stalls is littered with vegetable peel and fruit rinds. The odd petal from one of the flower stands is trodden into the muck. Sellers sit on mats among sacks of pulses and spices, droning out their prices in a steady chant. The multicolored canopies overhead hang dark and heavy with the weight of rain. I hear two women arguing with a trader over the price of a cut of meat. They say they won't pay that much for a dog. Dead pink flesh is stacked up at the front of the stall and blackened bodies hang from hooks around the edge. The spicy air is heavy with the smell of blood. All around people shuffle through the mud, listening for the price of goods. I notice a group of dirty children about half my age slipping through the crowd and I clutch my poster closer to my chest. When I reach the building at the far end of the market, there are microwaves and ornaments and bits of clothing piled up on tables outside. The pawnbroker sits at the back of the dim room with his feet propped up on a box of coat hangers. The soles of his feet are black and his vest hangs limply from his bony shoulders. As I enter, I have to duck because the shutter has only been raised halfway. The room is cool and gloomy and a radio crackles in the corner. As I approach the man, he scratches his scrawny arm and burps. What have you got for me? He asks. Very carefully, I unroll the poster and hold it up for him to see. I don't buy posters, kid. Go home. But it's signed, I say. It's worth a lot of money. <laughs> I don't think so. That's not a real autograph. Yes, it is, Bapak, I promise. There's even an 11 in the loop, see? Look, he says, sitting forward and sorting through the roll of notes around his middle finger. I don't have time for whatever game it is you're playing. They print those things by the thousand. That signature will be in the same corner of every copy. I feel tears coming to my eyes, but I blink them away. You're lying. You just want me to believe it's fake so you can offer me a cheaper price. The man stops counting the notes and stands up. I don't want your stupid poster, kid. Now get out of here before I beat you. He reaches down for a coat hanger and I quickly duck under the shutter and make my way into the crowd. The tears come again, but this time I let them roll down my cheeks. I lower my head and let myself be knocked from shoulder to shoulder, not caring as my poster is crumpled and torn by the press of bodies. A group of men stand by an electronics store laughing and I feel my cheeks grow hot. How could anyone be so stupid? I fight against the crowd, desperate to escape. People raise their hands and shout as I force a path through the wall of bodies. Someone shoves me and I stumble, landing on my hands. A dirty, gnarled foot swings in my direction and I have to scamper between two stalls to avoid it. I crawl behind a pile of sacks, dragging my poster along with me before getting to my feet. My knees and hands are black with mud, but I keep going. I run down an alley, the dark low sky like a roof above me, and I don't stop running until I'm out in the open by a busy road. I double over, my muddy hands on my muddy knees and breathe hard. The breath catches in my chest and I shudder. I cry properly like a hungry baby, my whole body seems to shake, tears blur my vision and I can feel strands of saliva dripping from my open mouth. No one on the pavement stops. They walk by, quickening their pace to get past me. 
I wiped my forearm across my eyes and stare down at the ruined poster in my hands. Wakefield's pristine white kit is covered in mud. A corner has been ripped off. The autograph is unreadable among the folds and the crinkles. And I can't help thinking, standing here in my fake boots, holding a fake poster, am I living a fake life in a fake world? My hands tighten around the poster, crumpling it even more, and I search for some way to throw it away. That's when I realize where I am and why the congested road seems so familiar. I'm standing outside the factory, closed for the night. I remember what Roshi said about working at the factory forever, about waiting for something that's never going to happen. And as I look at the chained and padlocked door, dark clouds looming over the roof, it's hard to imagine ever escaping it. I walk round the side of the factory to the big bins, hauling one of the lids open, I pause before tossing the poster in. I'm about to drop the lid when I notice the homeless man curled up on a bed of cardboard inside. He must be drunk again because he doesn't stir. I close the lid and turn to leave. But I stop. A man with long hair and gray rags shuffles towards one of the other bins. Just before he reaches it, he glances over at me and raises the half-empty bottle in his hand. Monsoon, he shouts, pointing at the sky. Then he lifts the lid and tumbles inside. I look back at the bin in front of me. I grip the edge of the lid and ease it open, but I can't see anything. The darkening sky forces me to open it further for a better look. The man inside moves to cover his head, but he's too slow. The face is unmistakable. Uncle, I stammer. The man lowers his hand and I see the same dark eyes that stared at me from a newspaper page, but his expression isn't cold and fierce. His black eyebrows bunch in confusion and his stubbly mouth hangs open, unsure what to say. He looks like a tired, grubby version of dad. Uncle Aaron, I say, trying to sound familiar, but just sounding scared. I it's me, it's, it's, it's Booty. His face softens. He looks down at the crumpled poster on his lap, and after a moment's hesitation, he scrambles to get out of the bin. I always imagined he'd be stocky and strong, but as I help him out, I can feel how thin he is through his torn prison clothes. He leans a hand on my shoulder as he stands, exhausted by the sudden exertion. Is it really you, Buddy? he says, staring hard into my eyes. Yes, uncle, I say. The pressure on my shoulder grows, and I notice how unsteady he is. Why don't we sit down for a moment? Uncle takes a long look round before agreeing, and we rest with our backs against the bin. You know, he says, it's been a long time since anyone called me uncle. He tries to smile. Or Aaron, come to think of it. Why, I ask, what did they call you in, uh, on, I struggle to find the right word, in prison, he asks, offering another painful looking smile. On Nusa Kambangan? I nod. He says Nusa Kambangan, the way I say Barcelona. They called me whatever they wanted to call me, but officially I was known as 9875B. He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath in through his nose. Oh, isn't it wonderful, he asks. When he opens his eyes again, I notice they are lined with tears. Take a deep breath and tell me. It's the sweetest thing. I do as I'm told. My nostrils fill with the smell of petrol and rained on tarmac. I cough a little bit. <coughs> it's, it's wonderful, I say. When I look at Uncle again, he is staring at me with a faint smile on his face, shaking his head. I can't believe how much you've grown, he says. You must be at least 11 by now. I turned 12 last week. He lets out a low whistle. Has it really been that long, he asks, although he seems to be asking someone else. We sit in silence for a few minutes watching the storm clouds deepen and darken. Soon it will be night. I'm guessing you're not a Real Madrid fan, asks Uncle, jabbing a thumb over his shoulder towards the bin. 
For a moment, I don't know what he's talking about, but then I remember my poster. No, I, I am, I say. They're the greatest team in the world. One day, I'm going to play for them. I feel stupid as soon as I've said it, but my uncle raises his eyebrows in interest. Is that so? Well, the first step is getting into the academy. If I could afford to play there, I might get spotted, but it's impossible without sponsorship, and I don't know if I'm good enough. He smiles. So why are you canning a poster of that pretty boy if you're such a big fan? I look at my boots, my fake boots. It's ruined, I say. Uncle nods. He seems to understand. Does Rios still play for Real Madrid? He was a magician. Roshi told me all about Rios, one of the best footballers who ever lived. His nickname was Rios El Dios, the god. He won every trophy going and scored hundreds of goals for Real Madrid. Nobody liked to play against him because he was unstoppable. A bit like Kieran Wakefield, really. But he retired. He retired ages ago, when I was about four. No, I say, Kieran Wakefield is their best player now. My uncle shakes his head. I've never heard of him. What? You must have. He's the one on the poster. What about Leon Belmonte? Uncle shakes his head again. Unfortunately, I didn't get to watch much football on the inside. I frown, picking at the loose sole of my shoe. Uncle, I say, how long were you inside for? A long time, years and years, too many to count. He watches as I tighten my shoe. The three little cuts on my fingertip bleed into the laces. When did you do that? He asks, nodding at my injury. About a week ago, he looks into my face. So you've got the family curse too. Uncle rolls up his sleeve and shows me a graze on his forearm that's surrounded by a purple bruise. The blood still looks wet. We used to get through a tin of coconut butter a week, Elvis and I, when we were boys. It's a dangerous business, being a brother. He turns away again touching the cut on his arm. It seems like a different life, he says, looking back. For a moment, I think he's going to say something else, but instead he unrolls his sleeve and stares at the ground between his feet. It starts to rain. I think about dad and the choice the dragon gave to grandma. What are you going to do? I ask. I mean, there are people out hunting for you. You're on the front pages of the newspapers. Surely you can't run forever. I know and I don't intend to keep running. I just want to see my family again, to make things right. I knew it wouldn't be long before they finished me on that island, and I didn't want to die without saying goodbye. I don't even know whether my mother is still alive. She's fine, I say, struggling to concentrate on Uncle's words. She's indestructible. Uncle laughs, but all I can hear is Grandma's voice repeating the same sentence. You can't expect a mother to sacrifice one son to save another. Uncle looks in both directions to check we're still alone, but I doubt he can see very far in the darkness. I don't expect you to help me, Booty, but if you could take me to your parents, just so I can talk to them, then I promise to disappear for good. Then it's the dragon's voice, calm and insistent in my head. If Aaron were to cooperate in a little export project I've been working on, we could help keep him out of prison for good, couldn't we, brother? And then I realized that Grandma shouldn't be made to choose between her sons. I desperately try to think of another way, but I can't escape the voice in my head. My voice. The decision is yours, Booty. You must make the choice. Okay, I say. I'll take you. Really? You do that for me? I look at my feet. Yes. Thank you, Uncle says, drawing me into a hug. He holds me so tightly that he squeezes a tear to my eye. I quickly wipe it away. But you can't just walk through the streets, I say. Someone might recognize you. If you wait here, I'll bring somebody to fetch you. Well, how long will you be? Not long. 
uncle clambers back into the bin and I set off wandering the streets until I find what I'm looking for. I was right. It doesn't take long. I approach the police car sitting by the curb and knock on the glass. The window rolls down and a young policeman sticks his head out. What do you want? He asks. I need the chief inspector. Oh yeah, and what makes you think he'll come out in the rain for some street kid? Because I found something the dragon has been looking for. And unless you want to upset the dragon, I suggest you do what I say. The policeman looks at me as though I've just pulled the pin from a hand grenade. Then he scrambles for his walkie-talkie and calls it in. <laughs>